All right. Uh, hi, guys. Welcome. Welcome back to the second part of this live code demonstration where we'll be explaining two types of clustering methods, that being the k-means and the hierarchical clustering. Um, in this half, we're going to be running this using R Studios. So hopefully, if you have choose, chosen the session, that you've read the uh, prerequisite so that you can keep up with this demo. But yeah, just to recap, uh, the code can be found via GitHub link, which is currently in the chat. Um, and all that is required is for you to clone that repo into your local computer uh, after you've obviously installed and downloaded the appropriate software. Um, if you haven't been able to do this so far, then please feel free to follow the code along via the web link uh, ending in the HTML, which again is available in our GitHub repo. Um, but yeah, let's let's get started. I will just zoom in a bit to make sure uh, we can we can see the code clearly. But if you've managed to clone this repo correctly, then you should be seeing what I'm seeing now, which includes an R markdown file for the k-means tutorial and an R markdown file for the hierarchical clustering tutorial. So yeah, as discussed, clustering is a technique in machine learning that attempts to find clusters of observations within a data set. Um, we are going to be looking at two data sets for the k-means. Uh, this includes a data set called the USA Arrests and a data set called IRIS, which was previously run by Louise in our Python tutorial. Before beginning, you need to make sure that you have installed and loaded the correct packages. The packages for k-means include cluster r, cluster, facto extra, and facto extra. The remaining packages um, are more related to like data manipulation and um, data pre-processing. But yeah, let's let's begin by looking at our USA dataset. The USA dataset contains statistics in arrest per 100,000 residents for assault, murder, and rape in each of the 50 US states in 1973. It also includes the percentage of the population living in urban areas. So the aim of this dataset is to see if there's any dependency between the state being acquired and the arrest history. So the first step would just to be re to read in this data set. Um, I'm currently calling this into um, a new data frame called DF, and I'm using that assignment operator to do so. I've also included an na.admit, so this just makes or makes sure that we um, remove any missing values in our data set. We can use the head function to explore the data set briefly. And as you can see, we have our um, three crime types and our urban population, as well as the states that are according. <clears throat> so the first stop, first step when it comes to running k-means is to scale and standardize your data set. In R, this can be done using the, the scale function under the R base package. So nothing needs to be installed to run this function. Scaling is basically a technique for comparing data that isn't measured in the same way. So this basically means that, like the normalization of a data set using the mean value and the standard deviation. Um, scaling is also known as standardizing. So these, these terms are synonymous, but let's go ahead and scale our data set. Once we do this, we can then use the head function to see how results are different. Um, so yeah, as you can see, that the, the scale function in short basically subtracts the values of each column by the matching center value from the argument. Um, but once we have scaled our data set, we can then move on to do some of the analysis. And the first part of the analysis involves a, a distance matrix. Um, now, typically a correlation matrix is used to summarize data as, um, and there are, there are a couple of reasons why you might want to run a distance matrix before creating a model for your k-means. The first is to summarize the data set. Uh, by visualizing, we can then understand the relationships between each variables. Another reason might be to form some sort of diagnostic for advanced analysis, such as a regression model. Um, but in our instance, we're just going to be using this for visualization purposes. And we can do this by running the getDist function. 
on our data frame and I'm calling this into a new data frame called distance. It is typically advised to create new data frames when running um, multiple stages of analysis. And I think it's just clearer when running a tutorial to, to see how the data frame um, changes as we go along. So we go ahead and run that line. We can then use the um, fvis dist function to plot this correlation matrix. I've also set some um, attribute variables, so the gradient and the colors. And if we run this, we'll get a image of a correlation matrix. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the higher the value, the higher the association, and the lower value is the lower the association. And this is just one way to start to explore your data set. Um, but as you can see, this, is, this isn't all too clear to read and it can be quite difficult to understand the interpretations. And so um, we can then move on to run our k-means analysis to start to understand the relationships between these variables, between these states, um, and start to cluster these, these, these states into a more uh, confined group. So let's go ahead and run our k-means analysis. So yeah, the basic idea behind k-means clustering consists of defining clusters so that the total um, intra-cluster variation, also known as within cluster variation, is minimized. And um, we can compute this k-means in R with the k-means function. Here we'll group the data set into two clusters. Um, the k-means function also has this argument called n star. And basically this attempts to apply multiple initial configurations and reports the best ones for us to use. So I'm gonna start with a configuration of 25 and a center of two. I'm again assigning this to a new data frame called K2. We can use the SDR function, which allows us to view the cluster in more detail. So if we print these results, uh, we we'll see we have quite a messy array of, or quite a messy list of information. So let's just explore K2 on its own. And as you can see, we have our cluster means for each of our variable types. That includes three crime types and the urban population. We also have our clustering vectors within each state. And we have um, information on its standard deviation. Yeah, so if we print these results, we'll see that the groupings resulted in two clusters, sizes of 30 and 20. As you can see, apologies, as you can see in this function, two groupings, 30 and 20. Uh, we also get the cluster assignment for each observation. And um, yeah, this is just one way to explore that. If there are more than two dimensions, it's important to know that the FVIS cluster will perform their principal component analysis and plot the data points according to the first two principal components that explain the majority of the variance. But for now, uh, we can just go ahead and start to visualize our data set using the FVIS cluster function. So we call on our clustered uh, data set, which is the K2, and we refer to our original data set as DF. So if we run this and run a visualization, you can see how our um, our states have been clustered into, into two clusters. Uh, we see that there's a clear distinction, um, there's no overlap, and we can see that the variation in the two are similar. You could also use a standard pairwise scatter plot to basically illustrate the clusters compared to the original variables. And uh, we can do this using functions from the Dipler package. So this is the AsTibler, AsTibble, sorry. Um, so calling on our original data set, we then call on AsTibble. We then mutate this so that our uh, state names and clusters have the appropriate names given. And then we can use the ggplot to simply um, 
run a scatter plot to do so. Um, so let's have a look at how this would look. As you can see, it's very similar to what we um, produce with the k-means plot, but we haven't got those nice um, groups of clusters that were seen before. So this is why someone might choose to run this k-means plot compared to a standard pairwise scatter plot. But uh, nevertheless, that brings us to our second data set. So we've briefly explored um, the open US crime data set, but we can move on to look at uh, IRIS, which is a labeled data set. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we can, the algorithm will cluster the data and we will be able to compare the predicted results with the original results, getting the accuracy of the model. So let's just have a look at what would happen if we created a simple ggplot and pointed our variables. So as we can see, uh, Satota is going to be clustered easier. Meanwhile, there is noise between Vascala and Virginica, even when they look perfectly clustered. You can see that variation between the two colors, uh, blue and green. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to start to run that model. So again, yeah, k-mean is initialized in that base package from R, so we don't need to install any packages. And in the k-means function, it is necessary to set center, which is the number of groups that we, as we did before with the crime data set. Um, but in this case, we know that this value will be three, so let's set that. But in our instance, we're going to try and build a model that where we didn't know how many clusters we had, and this is because we're dealing with unsupervised data. So the first step would just be to uh, set the seed. And this is just a random iteration so that the cluster can work. We call on a new data set called iris cluster. We use the k-means function from the base package. And this little bit of code here basically removes the it selects the columns one to four and excludes column five, which is that labeled variable that we don't want. We then set the center to three and we set our iterations to 20. If you run this code, you'll see in your global environment that a new um, uh, data set has been created called Iris Cluster. So let's have a quick look at that. So again, we have our three clusters of sizes 38, 62, and 50. We also have the within um, sum of squares. Um, we can use the table function to basically compare the predicted values to the clustered values as we did before. And this brings up this nice little table that gives you a very nice summary. But the next step would, to, would be to plot this data so that we can see those clusters a bit more effectively. And here we have a really nice uh, display of our three variables, of our three plant types, uh, using some attribute variables such as color, shade, and labels. I've set these to true to make sure that uh, these represent different colors. And as you can see, there's still that overlap, there's still that uh, variation between our two plant types as seen before. So the next step would then be to evaluate your model. Uh, we're going to be using the elbow plot method to do so. So we might not always be known what the exact number of centers are, especially when we have an unlabeled data set. Therefore, we can use the elbow plot method to examine the centers we defined. Um, I think it's important to recall that the basic idea behind clustering, such as k-means, is to define clusters so that the total within cluster variation is minimized. And this is what the elbow plot tries to examine. So let's have a run of uh, this function here. What this function does is creates a nice elbow plot. And this elbow plot indicates wherever there is a bend, um, would be the like optimal number of clusters. So in our case, the optimal number 
the, the results suggest that four could be the optimal number of clusters as it appears to be like the bend or the elbow in the plot. I'd also like to just draw attention to um, another, another way that you could plot the clusters. Um, you could use the, the package. Um, it's named, if I remember correctly, fviz underscore nb cluster. Um, and I'll quickly just write this out because we have a bit of time. So I'm going to call on a new data frame called data frame two. And again, I'm going to call in the Irish data set. Your second step would be to scale this data set. I'm going to use that scale function from the base package. We're going to call on data frame two. Um, because we have a categorical variable in our data set, we want this to be removed. So you could either select columns one to four as before, or you could just simply minus the column that is not relevant to you. First and foremost, call in data frame two, then we can scale our object. Um, and then we can use the fviz underscore nb plus function to create a nice plot. Uh, we then run the k-means and the method I'm going to be using is the uh, WSS method, which I think is applies to, and then we have that kind of same elbow plot. You could also add a geo underscore v-line, which is part of the ggplot2 package. And I'll just add an x-intercept. Uh, we'll add this at three and a line type of, uh, I'm going to say two, so it's not too obvious. And this basically will be able to add a line straight down where we can see that the optimal number of clusters is indeed three. But yeah, that's our k-means um, analysis. So we're going to move on to the hierarchical clustering. So let me just open that up. Push this up. Um, so yeah, let's let's get started. So as mentioned in our previous session, there are two approaches to hierarchical clustering, which is the algorithmative, if I've said that right, and the divisive. This is known as like the bottom up and the top down approach. Um, I think it's important to know that the first is good at identifying small clusters whereas the second is identifying uh, larger clusters. Um, we use the same packages to run k-means and hierarchical clustering methods. So this involves cluster R, cluster, and facto ex extra. However, there are some additional packages, packages to produce some of those visualizations, including the uh, Dendix 10 and the circlize and color splice but these are all just kind of for attributes and visualizations. Um, so hierarchical clustering can be performed on a data matrix using the function hclust from the cluster package. And we're gonna be continue looking at that Irish, the, the Iris data set. So the first step would be to load and prep the data. We've done this before, but I'm just going to rerun it again. We can get a quick summary of our data set, but we've already seen these. We have our sepal length, sepal width, a petal length, and petal width, as well as those species. But this species variable is uh, not appropriate when we are dealing with unsupervised methods. So we're going to treat this as a um, unlabeled data set. It's always good to check for missing values, and you can do that using the is.null function. If, you're, if the Irish data set did have missing values, then you could simply just admit this like we did for the USA arrest data set. Now I'm gonna briefly discuss two different types of methods that result in the same output and same, um, same values. But I think it's interesting to know that because R has so many packages available to run clustering, that I wanted to introduce two concepts that so that you, know, you can explore it yourself. Um, but yeah, let's start with some basic clustering. Again, we need to perform these on just the numeric values. So we use that uh, function within the square, back, 
square brackets to select our columns one to four. We're going to be using the function dist. Basically, this function computes and returns the distance matrix computed by using the specified distance measure to compute the distances between the rows of a data matrix. Very confusing, apologies. Um, but if we go ahead and run this, we then basically just have a data matrix that allows us to run hclust. Uh, so you need to run this step uh, before exploring a data frame. But now we can use the hclust to run that hierarchical clustering. I've also called this into a new data frame called hcluster just for just for a bit of clarity. Um, so if we explore this, we'll see that we've used a uh, Euclidean distance and there are 150 objects of which we already knew. So I think it's also important to know that the distance can be any type. So this could be Euclidean, this could be uh, Manhattan, but HCLUST automatically uses the Euclidean distance. Um, so once we have established our hierarchical clustering, we can then go ahead and visualize our data set. And yes, this is all it takes to run a hierarchical clustering in R. So maybe a little bit less uh, complicated than the Python code, but I'm going to talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of using either towards the end of this talk. So let's go ahead and visualize our clusters using a dendrogram. So just to recap, a dendrogram is simply a diagram that shows the hierarchical relationship between objects. So your first step would be to basically convert your hierarchical clustering data set into a dendrogram, and we can do this using the as.dendrogram. So I've called onto a new data set called HCD, which just stands for the hierarchical clustering dendrogram, called on the as.dendrogram packet uh, function, and uh, group this with our, our um, hierarchical clustering. Let's go ahead and run that. So we then need to establish um, some attributes just to make the plot a little bit better, which is what I've done here. So I'm using node par. And um, basically, this is just a list of like plotting parameters to use for the nodes. Um, and then this list itself contains further attributes like, remember lab CX, CEX is basically just the numeric values to indicate the point size. You have the PCH, which stands for the plot character. Um, it's just a standard argument to set the characters that will be plotted um, in a number of R functions. We have CEX, which again is just uh, the numeric values indicating the point size, and we have our colors. We can then go ahead and plot this using the plot function. Um, I've added a few labels, I've added change a few colors and um, I've made the image horizontal. So let's see what happens if we run this chunk of code here. So now we have a cluster dendrogram, uh, which is similar to what we had seen in the Python tutorial. But obviously in this in instance, the um, dendrogram is horizontal rather than vertical, but you can simply change this if you have a preference by running uh, false instead of true. So now we've got this sitting the, the right way up. We can see our defined clusters as three. <clears throat> um, and that has produced our first dendrogram for our iris data, iris data set. So yeah, now we're going to move on to our method two, which is another way to produce hierarchical clustering and to explore some of the packages and functions that are available in R. So again, the first steps always involve removing those categorical variables. Um, I'm calling on a new data set this time called Iris2, so we can um, just have some differences be between what we had already worked on and we don't uh, lose anything that we've done. 
We are then going to store this as a separate data frame called species. Um, and if we have a quick look at, oh, and there we see the categorical variables have just been added to its own data set. And this means we don't lose any data set and this can be saved separately. Um, and the last step would be to convert your numeric values and add a color palette. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm also calling this onto a, um, oh. I probably haven't loaded a package. I think it might be from color space, but let's have a look. Yep, there we go. Uh, typical <laughs> our errors always go to load packages. But yeah, I've called this into a new data set and converted the value to numeric. And I've also just added a color palette. So then when we come to plotting our data set, we have different clusters with different colors. Um, our next step would be to, you could try to plot a uh, scatter plot matrix. So before even running any type of analysis, again, it's re recommended to evaluate any variance. Now, a scatter plot matrix are uh, they're basically a useful tool to help visualize the relationship between multiple quantitative um, variables. You could also use like uh, parallel coordinates to explore high dimensional multivariate data, but for sake of simplicity, I've stuck with a scatter plot because I do feel like they sometimes are easier to interpret. Um, but yeah, to plot a scatter plot, you can simply just use the uh, pairs code. We call on our data set and I adjust for some of the attributes. I'm calling on our species column, which is that new data set we have created above. And I'm simply going to add some legends to make this plot, to make this image a little bit more readable. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we can see our differences between the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length and the petal width. And we can see the relationship between the two. We can see that Satosa species are distinctively different from Versicolor and Virginica. And this is because they have a lower petal length and a lower petal width. But Versicolor and Virginica cannot easily be separated based on measurements of their sepal and petal width. So a scatter plot provides a really good, uh, like, a really good ground for you to decide whether your data set or how your data set should be clustered. And it allows you to explore some of that variation before even starting to create a model. So yeah, the, um, the default hierarchical clustering method in the hclust package is complete. And um, as we learned in the k-mean tutorial, we measure this dissimilarity of observations using distance measures. So that's that Euclidean distance or the Manhattan distance. Um, and in R, the Euclidean distance is used by default to measure the dissimilarity between each pairs of observations. Um, but yeah, as we know, it's very easy to compute this dissimilarity by using that guess get dist function. But how do we measure the, the dissimilarity between two clusters of observations? There are a number of different cluster algorithms or methods known as our linkage methods that have been developed to answer this question. There are, off the top of my head, there are five types of methods to measure the distance between clusters. Um, we're going to be looking at three different methods known as the complete, the single, and the average. Um, the first is the complete. And, <coughs> excuse me, the complete basically computes the maximum distance between the clusters before merging them and it computes all pairwise dissimilarities between the element in cluster one 
and the elements in cluster two and considers the largest value of these dissimilarities. So let's have a go at running a um, complete hierarchical clustering method on our iris data set. Um, the first step is to call on that dist function that applies that dis dis dissimilarity matrix. We can then run our hierarchical clustering method using the complete method. Um, and we then need to re-level, I'm just simply re-leveling some of those variables here. We can then apply our dendrogram. Um, we also want to reorder the observations. So we can do this using the rotate function. And again, I've probably forgot to load a package. So I'm just gonna rerun all of these because I got an error saying that there was no package that existed. There we go. So yeah, I feel like that was uh, from the the um, facto extra package that I failed to load in the beginning, but never mind. We can then move on to color the branches based on the clusters, and I'm using the color underscore branch to do so, and I'm setting that k means to three. So we can go ahead and run that line. The next step would be to manually match the labels um, to the real classifications of the flowers. Um, and I'm using the uh, sort levels values to do so. So we can go ahead and run this. The next step would then to be add the flowers to the types of labels. And we can then hang the dendrogram, which basically just means to um, separate the values a little bit better so we can see the differences between the nodes in our dendrogram. And uh, this, is, this next line is simply just reducing the size of the values. And our last step and our final step would be to plot these. So if we go ahead and plot these, oh, apologies. We see that we have our clustered iris data set. We have a bit of a nicer diagram than we did uh, running it from method one. But as you can see, we still have our three clusters in, um, available. Uh, again, if it becomes confusing to read a dendrogram that's horizontal, we can simply change this to uh, false so that we have a vertical dendrogram. And if we run this again, it will simply just rotate on its side. Um, I think it's important just to kind of explain how to exactly read a dendrogram because I understand it can be confusing but basically each leaf corresponds to one observation and as we move up the tree observations that are similar to each other are combined into branches which are themselves fused at a higher level um, so this height of the fusion provided on the vertical axis indicates the dissimilarity between two observations the higher the height of the fusion, the less similar the observations are. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of how you interpret a dendrogram. Um, so once you have your dendrogram, your next step would then to run some sort of evaluation process on this. Uh, again, we're gonna be using the elbow plot method to do so. Um, so similar to how we determine optimal clusters with the k-means clusterings, we can execute similar approaches for hierarchical clustering. Um, to perform the elbow method, you just need to change the second argument in the fphys underscore mb plus function to fun equals um, h cut. So that's just indicating that this is a hierarchical method. And if we run this, uh, we'll see we have that similar elbow plot with that bend at our stage number three. So let's just have a look at how we could explore different linkage messages. We talked about the complete method, which is the maximum distance, but other, messages, other methods include the single. 
So let's have a look at how the single method would run. The single method is kind of opposite to the complete in that it computes the minimum distance between clusters before merging them. So we can run this whole chunk of code by just pressing the um, arrow that faces to the right. And this will plot our dendrogram for us. And as you can see, we have a really like messy picture right now, which would indicate that um, the single method probably isn't the best to compute the pairwise dissimilarities between our clusters. Um, and this is a typical flaw with the single method. It tends to produce long or loose clusters that can be difficult to interpret. Uh, but what about the average method? We can go ahead and change this to average just to see how this would look. Now with the average method, what we are doing is basically computing the average distance between clusters before merging them. So we have the maximum, the minimum, and the average, which are three different methods. And with the average, it basically computes all pairwise dissimilarities between the elements in cluster one and the elements in cluster two, and then considers the average of these dissim dissimilarities as the distance between the two clusters. So let's have a go at just running this chunk of code and changing our method to average. And as you can see, we have um, a little bit of a different dendrogram. It's a bit more similar to our complete method, but um, you can still see that there are three, three clusters and that would be our ideal k-means. K but how would you go about analyzing which method is better, not just from looking at a dendrogram? <clears throat> yeah, so we can examine which of these basically has the strongest clustering structure or the strongest linkage method. Um, so for the purpose of this, I'm going to create an object that groups the three different methods that we tried into a new object called hclust methods. And then I'm basically going to chain them together into a single uh, dend list object, which as the name implies, can hold a bunch of dendrograms together for the purpose of further analysis. Um, and I'm going to use this sequence, uh, which is a for loop. Um, I won't explain too much what that does. But uh, yeah, this basically will allow us to compare those three different methods. And now we have a um, iris dend list, which includes the comparison of three methods. And what this has done is obtained the coefficients. The core den list obtains the coefficients to the correlation. Um, in this case, we're using a coefficient known as the cope henectic correlation, I believe it's called. Um, but you could also use like peerwise correlation. And this is where you as a researcher have to start questioning what type of research method would be better for your data set. But I'm going to go ahead and just use the um, the default setting for this. And here are our correlation statistics for each of our methods, which is the single, complete, and the average. And uh, we can simply plot this using a correlation plot. So yeah, from this figure, we can easily see that the most clustering methods yield very similar results except for the complete method, um, which yields a correlation measure of around 0 0.6, I'd say. Um, and yeah, that draws conclusion to our, well, that's the end of our tutorial for the k-means and the hierarchical clustering. I would like to just draw attention to an additional R markdown script that I wrote. Um, I won't be, go be going through it now, but if you're interested in understanding how a principal component analysis can work in a bit more detail, then you can explore this wholesale customer data set and work through some of this code by yourself. It starts by running um, some pre-processing, some descriptive analysis. Uh, we focus on standardizing the data set. We then refit a k-means model. So this is exactly what we've done in our previous two scripts. We then look at evaluation. 
And then we have uh, the PCA at the bottom here. I mean, I'm not sure we have time to run through this now. No, not quite. But yeah, take your time to explore this yourself and have a go at um, un like running a PCA analysis yourself. Uh, yeah, so thanks for listening. Um, I think I'll just summarise with a few points when it comes to hierarchical clustering in that, yes, clustering can be a very useful tool for data analysis in like unsupervised setting. However, there are a number of issues that arise in performing clustering. And I think there are three things that you should probably be concerned or worry about when running this type of model. The first would be what dissimilarity measure should be used. The second, which would be uh, what type of linkage should you use? So um, we had a go at exploring three different linkage methods, and then we looked at the correlation coefficients between the three to understand which one has the highest variation. And then the last step would be like, where should we cut the dendrogram in order to obtain clusters? So a lot of these questions are can be answered, I guess, dependent on your your questions as a researcher, your your interests, your aims, your purposes. Um, so yeah, each of these like decisions can have a strong impact on the results obtained, but there is no right answer to which one, you know, is right. Which linkage method could be right for you? I think as long as you choose a method that um, comes with an explanation, then and kind of fits your research methods and aims, then you should. Yeah, that should be it. Um, and I understand that some of these k-means and hierarchical clusterings can be performed really, really quickly in R, as you saw. But there are many things important to consider, um, not just from attribute placement, um, but from understanding these like more deeper theoretical questions about what like dissimilarity measure should be used. Uh, but yeah, that's the end of this tutorial. Uh, there are some references listed in the R markdown if you'd like more like information on some of these functions and packages. But thank you all for listening 